Father, we ask you to anoint the hearts as well as the speaker, that Jesus' word and will should be done tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you turn to 1 Corinthians 14, I want to deal tonight with one verse there, verse 15. Verse 15, 1 Corinthians 14, what is it then, Paul says, I will pray with the Spirit. We could say in the Spirit, can be translated that way. I will pray in the Spirit, I will pray in or with the understanding also. I will sing in or with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. I wonder what we did with that verse all of those years, that we did not sing in the Spirit or pray in the Spirit. What did we do with that? Because we knew what it was to pray or sing with the understanding, because that's what we were doing. Well, what did we do with it? We didn't do anything until we dealt with it. And after we dealt with it, we knew what he meant. Many years ago, before I became charismatic, I read in this book on Brethren History how somebody heard what they thought was a choir in this charismatic church. It was just the people singing. And said, you couldn't make out any words, but it was the most beautiful heavenly music you've ever heard. And he wrote quite a bit about that, trying to figure that out. He said as a young man, he would just lie outside the church on the hillside and listen to those beautiful voices, all in harmony. You couldn't make out words. One was not saying what the other was saying even, but it was in perfect harmony. The brethren had the baptism of the Holy Spirit at one time. Well, anyway, Paul says he will sing with the Spirit and sing with the understanding, as well as pray both ways. There are two ways to sing and two ways to pray. So tonight I'm going to continue last Sunday's instructions in prayer. Now, praying can be compared to watering a garden. The Lord gave me this some time ago through prophecy. As I've said, at times he has given me a message that I prophesy. Now, it doesn't mean to prophesy all I say to you, but I prophesy the essential points or whatever. So he showed me how that praying is like watering a garden or a farm. You know, shrubs and so forth, and particular kinds of plants, you have to take a bucket of water and water them individually at the base, gallon, five-gallon bucket of water. We did that for years over there in our yard until the Garden of Eden now has taken off by itself, so we don't water it anymore. We just try to keep it from growing so fast. <laughs> but that's labor, and it's much easier to take a hose and water your garden, but you still have to go to the garage, get the hose, carry it to the garden, go back, turn the water on, stand there and direct it for 30 minutes or an hour, then go back and turn it off, wind it up, take it back in the garage. That's work, but it's not as much work as a five-gallon bucket. I think you have the point by now. But it's easier than that to have a sprinkler system where you just turn it on and it sprinkles and you watch it. But you still have to set it up and turn it on and off, don't you? And direct it and move it about. And so it's easier than that, like some farms are irrigated by ditches where you just put a pump in the creek, the river, the pond, the lake, and turn the pump on and it waters itself. But that still takes work. You've got to watch it. You've got to turn it on and off. You have to dig the ditches. And easier than all of that is when God from heaven sends his rain and you just sit back and rest. <laughs> Making any connections yet? And let God water your garden. So it is with prayer. There are two categories of prayer that Paul deals with here, and you can sum up all types of prayer, thanksgivings, praise, intercessions, supplications, petition, under these two types. Because whenever you pray... You're praying one of these two ways, and sometimes both with the understanding or with the Spirit, or in the Spirit, by the Spirit, as he gives you the words to utter. And anyone who's received the baptism of the Holy Spirit knows there's a vast difference in praying with the mind, where your mind forms the words and the concepts. You see, if I started to pray now about this body, I'd have to think words and concepts and needs would start flooding in on my mind and people who are not growing, minority, praise God, people who insist on remaining a problem, but everybody has needs that I pray for every day. You know, I mean, pray for the body. I have to articulate that in words. 
But you see, after I articulate that in words, then lasamoreata kabosi mashanda baruta kabosea. And I'm thinking faith assembly, you see. And there's a rest as the Holy Spirit begins to intercede through me. Now, that can't be debated. I don't even have to think. I can turn pages. I could paint walls, not that I would, type letters while I pray in the Spirit. And I do a lot of those things, praying in the Spirit. You know, you can fix a leak on your roof and pray in tongues while you're doing it. Because it's no real labor. The Holy Spirit's going to teach you things about prayer in the Spirit tonight that haven't been said before. Already you've heard some things because it came through prophecy. That's the reason that it will have effect in your heart if you will listen carefully because it's not something you got out of a book somewhere, four points in a poem. Or is it three? I've forgotten. It's been so long since I went that route. It would be incorrect to think that all prayer with the understanding where your mind forms the words and the concepts is to be compared to the labor of watering individually plants with a five-gallon bucket. And it's also incorrect to think that all prayer in the Spirit is just a rest to be compared with rain from heaven. To think that all is that way. Generally, it's the way we said. But think of the times when you pray with the understanding, times of thanksgiving and praise and rejoicing. That can be a time of real joy and refreshing. That you want to say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, for that healing or whatever. And you just want to hear yourself saying what you want to say. So that isn't real labor. That could be compared to maybe sprinkling with a hose. You know, all the work I said to get the hose to the spot and take it back. It's still work, but it's certainly not to be compared with watering with a five-gallon bucket of water each plant individually. But the times of trial and need and problems, home, church, office, business, wherever, this can be a time of real labor as you try to articulate those needs to God and look for solutions and talk it over with the Lord where praying in tongues about it is just not the way to do it at times where you've got to take your five-gallon bucket of water and water each of those trials and problems with your prayers. And sometimes this is the way God gives you the solution. As you're talking to him, comes out in English what you need to do or where the problem is or how it can be solved. You see, and it can be real work, but it's necessary because that's why he says he prays both ways. But when you compare the labor between the two, there's no comparison between laboring in words that you think up, there is a place for that, and letting the Spirit intercede through you. And so, as I say, there are times when praying with the understanding can be a real labor. Sometimes it isn't. Praise, thanksgiving. Sometimes the need is not as pressing, even when it's a need, not as serious. And it's not going to require so much watering with buckets as it is getting the hose out and sprinkling that problem with your prayers. Sometimes you can sprinkle your prayers. Well, pray five minutes, ten minutes, and other times you know as well as I do, it's just on your mind you're praying about it all day. So if you know how to put analogies to work, then I won't have to be here till midnight explaining all the things we mean and don't mean. Uh, just use your own Spirit-inspired imagination. Imagination's good if it's inspired by the Spirit because you can draw your own conclusions, make your own analogies. But certainly there's no comparison with prayer in the Spirit. But there are times when praying in the Spirit, you see, is not just like rain from heaven. It can require some work or labor on our part. Now, Jesus speaks of the time in John 7, 37, 39, the time when he's going to send the Holy Spirit. And through the baptism of the Spirit, he said, out of our innermost beings, translated belly in King James, but it's the middle region, your innermost being, from where will flow rivers, he said, of living waters. Jesus cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scriptures hath said, out of his innermost parts shall flow rivers of living water. Now notice it's a river flowing out of you. It's not something you pump up or you've created. And this spake he of the Spirit, which they believe on him, should receive. So we know what he's talking about, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And out of us flow these rivers of living water. Now anyone who's ever received the charismatic experience knows the difference between laboring 
with prayers of your understanding even when they're not so great needs you're praying about. You know, if I ask the Lord to anoint me tonight in a special way, sometimes I pray in a special way. I say, give me a double portion tonight, Lord. Well, I generally pray that. Same prayer every Sunday and Wednesday. But anyway, whatever I'm praying about, I like to hear myself say that to the Lord. I can think it and pray in the Spirit about it, but I say it and then I pray in the Spirit about it. So anyone knows the difference between what you need to articulate in words and then moving into the realm of prayer in the Spirit after you've stated the need, maybe. Maybe your need we're praying about or whatever. There's no comparison. It's a thousand times easier to pray in the Spirit than to say ten words in English because there's no real labor or effort. But it doesn't mean it's all just a rest like rain from heaven because it still requires that you put your vocal apparatus into operation. You can't just sit still and be anointed and keep your mouth shut say, I'm going to rest, I'm going to sit this one through. And the Spirit pray through you. You have to put your vocal apparatus into operation. We speak by faith what He gives, the Holy Spirit gives. It still requires that you do that, that you stay with it, as it were, until you know inwardly the need is met, or you're satisfied you've prayed sufficiently about it, and so forth. But there's no comparison between that and praying with the understanding. Although it is an effort in the sense that you have to do it, it's not the same as carrying buckets of water to water the need or the problem. Now there's another type praying with the Spirit that is a rest. You see what we've been talking about? It's a rest when you compare it to praying with the understanding. But there's another type of prayer in the Spirit that is a total rest, and that is when the Holy Spirit anoints you to speak in tongues and interpret, one or both, to edify the body of Christ with. When you're anointed, I don't mean when you're impressed you ought to, and you just speak it forth by faith, because sometimes that's the way it is. I'm talking about when that anointing comes, and, well, you either speak to the body or to yourself. you got to speak. you got to say it. And remember, Paul says, if there's not an opportunity to speak to the body, speak to yourself. That anointing that comes for that, to minister, to edify the body of Christ, or when the Holy Spirit anoints you with the spirit of intercession, intercession on behalf of some Christian in need. Maybe he's at death's door, going through a severe trial. She's undergoing temptation. Or interceding for the nation. Or to overcome some work of Satan where he's trying to hinder the work of the Lord and so forth. And you're anointed in a special time, in a special way. Now this is not merely prayer in the Spirit that we've been talking about. But this is prayer initiated by the Spirit prayer controlled by the Holy Spirit, and prayer terminated by the Holy Spirit. When he stops, you stop. When he starts, you start. Now, I can tell the way some look, and I don't mean that's a bad look, but the way that some look that you've never had that anointing. I don't know why if you're charismatic. I mean, I've been anointed to speak in the Spirit. You know whether it's tongues, interpretation, sometimes it's for yourself. This very message the basis of it started with such an anointing. In that case, I prophesied, but I've done both. You speak in tongues, that language that the Spirit gives you, then you interpret it back to yourself. And then I've been anointed with that special anointing to where if you don't speak, you'll burst. <laughs> and you fall on your knees and you begin to pray in the Spirit or more Accurately, the Spirit begins to pray through you. You are just His instrument and vessel. He initiates it. He controls it. He terminates it. When the burden lifts, you know it. You couldn't utter another word in tongues. Oh, you could by faith, but I'm talking about you know when it lifts. I've had that happen. When you either speak or burst and you fall on your knees and the Holy Spirit prays through you until that burden lifts. And that can be compared to rain from heaven. It is a rest in the sense that all you are is a vessel through whom the Holy Spirit speaks. You say, but don't you have to give your vocal apparatus? Friends, you just have to put it in gear. <laughs> I'm talking about anointing that some of you haven't experienced, as I say, because I could tell from the way you were looking. Well, now, what's he talking about? No, I've never felt that. Well, it isn't a feeling. It's an anointing. You may feel something. You may feel like 220 volts that you stuck your finger in the socket. The Holy Spirit kind of shocks don't hurt. 
but you can feel it. But I'm not talking about feeling, I'm talking about an anointing to where there's really no way you can prevent it. There's no way you can start it because he anoints you and you start praying. There's no effort to it. It's like rain from heaven. And when he stops, the burden has lifted you know to stop. For example, I heard one time, it's been years ago, of a friend whose daughter was seriously injured here close by this area, ran through a stop sign late at night, and a truck just demolished the car, and she died right there on the highway. And I don't remember all the details, but anyway, she came back to life. I think somebody was there from either Faith Assembly or Charismatic, and, you know, it's hard for people to die around people with faith. But she hovered between life and death, and her parents had already given her up. When I got to the hospital, I said, well, don't give her up. That isn't faith. Well, let the Lord's will be done. I said, that isn't Bible. The Lord's will is for you to believe for the healing of your daughter. But anyway... Before all of that, as soon as I got word, I was just sitting there. It was after a meeting where I'd spoken. We were sitting around eating when word came. And as soon as I heard it, this great anointing came. I knew exactly what it was for because, you know, anointings are different. You know, when you're anointed to do a certain thing, to pray for the sick, anointed to speak in tongues, anointed to prophesy, or anointed to intercede or whatever. And the knowledge of what is for comes with it. Parenthetically, let me say, I've never understood people who come and relate their visions and dreams to me and ask me what they mean. Because the meaning generally comes with it. Some things God holds to later, like he did Daniel. Daniel didn't know all he saw, what it meant. But I'm talking about the general application of these things. They'll say, I've got an anointing for my elbows down, for my shoulders down, and my hands. Does that mean I'm supposed to pray for this? You know, if you got an anointing, ask him. I didn't give you that anointing. I don't know what it's for. Wouldn't that be silly for me to tell you it's for this or that and God was anointing you for some other purpose? I tell people generally, sometimes it doesn't mean a thing. You're just anointed and that's the presence of the Holy Spirit. Am I supposed to go over there and pray for somebody? I've had them in this body everywhere I've ministered. What am I supposed to do with this? I said, I don't know. Why don't you ask the Lord? He gave it. I really don't know. Now, if he shows me, I'll tell you. If they say, well, this is the tenth time it's happened, well, then for at least ten times you should be seeking what it means because maybe it's the gifts of healing. Maybe he's saying something to you. Maybe it's false anointing. <laughs> if you go in the realm of feelings, some of the false teachers and prophets who left here talked about feeling. Oh, I just feel so anointed. One of them who died an alcoholic, he would say to me, oh, I feel a rush. He would even use drug culture language talk about the anointing and he'd say I feel a rush in my arms while we're talking you know I'd get off on something spiritual or whatever well I was never too enthused or impressed because I believe if you're anointed the Holy Spirit your language will change even but anyway when you're anointed this way as I was I knew it was far I went off in the bedroom in this person's home and I was there I guess about a half an hour, upwards of a half an hour, maybe longer, I don't know. And the burden lifted. When it lifted, I knew she would live. That's all there was. And she is still living to this hour. Now, it's a long story about the situation I don't want to get into. But the point is, I was anointed to intercede. I remember reading Dad Humbard's book. He was uneducated, did not speak good English, certainly didn't know French, <laughs> stuttered. And I mean poor English he even shows up in his book. And I don't say that to criticize, but to make the point. And as a young man, hadn't been in the ministry too long, he was in a French-speaking quarter, I think Louisiana or somewhere. He was preaching along his message, and in the middle of it, he just burst out in tongues, la ha ma kisi, ra ha, and just went on and on and on for, you know, two or three minutes and went back to his sermon. He didn't interpret. He didn't know what it meant. It was just there. The Spirit spoke through him. And so at the close, he gave his usual invitation. Here came this big mass of people. How many? I don't know. And, you know, they wanted to be saved. And they said, here's a young man who can't even speak good English. And he's in this French-speaking quarter, that is, you know, American French. He said he can't even speak good English. But he stopped in the middle of his sermon and spoke flawless, perfect French, exhorting us, you know, to get right with God. <laughs> so that really touched them, you see. He didn't have to stand on his head or tell jokes to get people down to receive Christ. 
You can be anointed that way. That isn't labor. That isn't work. That's a rest. And so I've experienced that. Well, a word of caution to those who may need it. And praise God, again, it's in the minority. But you see, I've lived these few years. And I know some things that if you don't keep saying them, well, people take advantage of it. Or they act like they didn't hear it. Or they say, I'm an exception. So a word of caution here. Because I said, when that kind of anointing comes, you either speak or burst. So don't use that to justify interrupting someone else speaking. I've had this happen. Well, I just couldn't help myself. I had to speak. I would have burst. And so they heard me say that. So put this on your taper in your notes, too, that I said this. And don't use that to justify not flowing with the moving of the Spirit in the service. If you are sensitive to the Spirit, you won't try to interrupt what's happening. If we're praying for the sick, that isn't the time to come up and give a testimony. I say it again because it does happen. For those who need it, we give this word of caution. Do what Paul said. Speak to yourself and to God. Now, there's a time when you know that now it'll fit right in. Now, I'm not going to digress and get into questions that people who are novices in the Christian faith and the charismatic experience are people who don't have the baptism. Right away, your thought is, well, he's quenching the Spirit. Well, let's just take all the revelation. The same revelation that says, quench not the Spirit, the same apostle who said that, says in 1 Corinthians 14, everything, let it be done decently and in order. Amen. You know, take turns. And he said, the spirit of a prophet is subject to the prophet. And that if you can't contain, and if you know you're anointed to speak in tongues, and there's no interpreter, and you're not going to interpret, if you don't have faith for that, then he says, speak to yourself in God. You can just get out there and talk to yourself all you want in tongues. You see, there's no prohibition on that. Forbid not tongues to yourself. But if you're going to speak in public, then you see there's an order, is all we're saying. So don't take my phrase that when this anointing from heaven comes to intercede, and sometimes I've ministered the whole service in the Spirit, it's just like Jesus says, it comes out of your innermost parts. It's just like literally someone has kicked you in the stomach. There's no pain. But it's interesting that the Bible uses terminology like that to explain what we really experience. These are things that have nothing to do with the mind, is what we're trying to say. And I can't explain to you scientifically or spiritually why the solar plexus is the region that Jesus referred to, but even in occult circles, when a medium, a trance medium and so forth, when they're functioning under the control of a spirit, it's out of that region, you see, that things come forth. They feel it there. They know that it's in the region of the solar plexus. And I notice when a very strong anointing comes, that that's the region where you experience it. Again, I can tell by the way some look, they've never experienced that. Well, maybe you don't have to experience that. If the Lord somehow refers to that region, then why wouldn't the counterfeit, the devil, you know, operate through the same region? So that we get it all said and nobody goes out and misquotes me. Be that as it may, don't look for feeling, look for faith. So both types of praying here in verse 15 are in order, in their place. I will pray with the Spirit, I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, I will sing with the understanding also. Now, along your charismatic walk, you'll have people, if you haven't, you haven't talked to anybody, I guess, or witnessed to them, you'll have people say, well, what do I need with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues? You know, I seem to be getting along all right, praying with the understanding, or God blesses my ministry, as one man said. I've seen people healed. I believe in praying for the sick. Well, you know, if he had a dozen healed in his 30 years of ministry, he'd call that, you know, a ministry of healing. I mean that literally, because the only way they'd ever pray for the sick is through the James 5, go to the house, and if he saw a dozen in 30 years, they'd say, that man's got a gift of God. But, you know, you can get a dozen healed in 30 years just by believing the Word. I mean, you can just pass by the house and say, believe, and they'll get healed, if they'll believe it. That doesn't mean you've got a ministry of healing. So they say, what do I need with the Holy Spirit? I'm getting along all right as I am. Well, let me give you a few reasons that ought to be obvious. They ought to just be falling off your tongue right now. One reason you need the Holy Spirit and you need to pray in tongues is so that you can pray beyond the limits of your finite understanding. 
If I had no other reason to mention, that'd be enough. So you can pray beyond the limits of your finite understanding. The more you know, the more degrees you've got, the less you would be qualified to pray prayers God will listen to. Now, I don't mean necessarily there has to be a contradiction, but I mean you've got a handicap working against you right away with a big education. Oh, it just takes too long to try to prove all the points. I just assume that you can figure that out for yourself. 1 Corinthians 1, God doesn't call many of those because they run around in the flesh pumping themselves up. And God says, no flesh will glory in my presence. There is absolutely no comparison between your most eloquent prayer with your understanding, how learned you are in the scriptures, and the least uneducated ditch digger praying one sentence in the Spirit. No comparison, absolutely none. Because it's the Holy Spirit praying through you wisdom, the divine wisdom of this universe. Even if it just is saying, hallelujah, praise the Lord through you, then that eloquent 10-minute oration that you bless God with, you thought. Now, I've already said, and so, dear friends, please don't have me have to parenthetically say what I don't mean all the time. I've already said the value of praying with the understanding. I do it. 10%, 90% praying in the Spirit. But that 10% is important. The scriptures say, I pray with the understanding and with the Spirit. I sing with the understanding and sing with the Spirit. So we're not knocking it. Why do you need the baptism so you can pray in the Spirit, so you can pray beyond the limits of your finite intellect? And it is so finite, you can't even compare yourself to an ant by analogy. By the way, they're pretty smart. Let's get something that's pretty dumb. You know, like a moth. He'll always destroy himself if he can find a light. <laughs> so you can't compare your intellect with a moth, a dumb moth. He'll just keep working at it up and down that lampshade until he can touch the bulb and pssst, that's all. And he falls down. And he's a creature of the night to begin with. It looks like he'd try to preserve what little time he has. But anyway, that's pretty dumb. It's so far beyond what the Spirit is saying through you than what your educated intellect could ever say. There's a place for that if it's sanctified, educated intellect. You see, Paul was educated. So he can't knock it if it glorifies God. Paul, much learning doth make thee mad. People knew he was smart. Peter said he writes things hard to be understood, which is... No asset, don't go out and try to write things hard to be understood. <laughs> and then secondly, why do you need the Holy Spirit so you can pray in tongues? So that you can sing beyond the limits of your ability, both in content and quality. <laughs> oh boy, I'll tell you, some people think they can sing. Some people know they're not too good at it so they don't put on a show. And some have some beautiful voices in this body with their understanding. I've heard them. You know, it's a gift. One has one gift, one has another. You can glorify God with your voice. But I'll tell you, the poorest singer with their understanding can sing beautifully, perfect harmony, with a thousand, two thousand other voices when they sing in the Spirit. That's why Paul says, I'll sing with the understanding. I like to hear those words. There's power, power, wonder-working power. I like to hear that, he says. Amazing grace. Well, they weren't written then, but whatever they were singing. They were singing the Psalms back then. And we've got some Psalms we sing. But he says, I sing with the Spirit too. And anyone who has ever sung a song with his understanding and then lifts up his voice or her voice with the Spirit. You know there's a difference. You ought to take your guitar sometime, or piano, and just sing in the Spirit. you find that the chords and the words and the notes, the words you don't understand because it's a supernatural language, you'll find they all fit. So you can sing beyond the limits of your ability, both in content and quality. I remember the night I received the Holy Spirit. I asked for a double portion. I claimed it. I got it. I don't want to go through all of that that led up to it. I've told it before. 
But it was that anointing. I'll tell you that anointing. My whole being was anointed. I prayed for two hours, I believe it was, at the McCormick Seminary cafeteria where I received in 66. The only reason I stopped, they said, we have to close the place and go home. But that anointing stayed with me. and It was hard to go to bed, you know. I said to my wife, it's still there. You know, even at bedtime, hours later, still there and just flow in the Spirit. Languages of the Spirit. I awakened sometime during the night and the anointing. I mean, there was nothing. The devil said, you had it, but you lost it. <laughs> well, see, I'm new at this. I don't know anything. If you knew anything, you would know more than I did. Oh, I had a head full of theological facts. I'm talking about the charismatic truths of the Bible. But you see, I'd learned to walk in faith back when I got saved. So I said to the devil, I said, feeling or not, I haven't lost it. It'll be there in the morning when I wake up. I don't need it now. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Went back to sleep by faith. Got up the next morning, no anointing, no nothing. Every stroke of the razor, you had it, but you lost it. <laughs> because there's nothing there. Go ahead and try to speak in tongues. And I said, I'm not going to try. I'm going to shave. I'm going to get dressed, comb my hair, do everything I ordinarily do. Then I'm going over in that corner. There was a chair there. I was still up in Chicago where I received staying with a brother in his house that night, and then we were driving back to tell our church about it. That was Saturday on Sunday. When I get done, then I'll go over there, and it'll be there. And I went on and took my time, and then when it was time to go pray in tongues in the Spirit, this was a brand new experience, you know, and that heavy anointing the night before, nothing there, no feeling, no anointing. I went over and knelt down and opened my mouth to pray in tongues, and it came out a song in the Spirit. As far as feeling, I didn't know if anything would be there, but I began to sing in the Spirit. And I was so happy, I began to weep and sing, and <laughs> oh, it was beautiful. Sing, I mean sing in the Spirit, giving the words and the melody. I didn't know you did that. Well, anyway, so you can sing. I'll give you another reason why you need the Holy Spirit, so you can pray in the Spirit. And that is so you can pray according to the will of God. Romans 8 26 and 27. So you can pray according to the will of God. You see, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is God's corrective for your tendency to get your old human reason and mind and logic and intellect in the way of His will concerning the matter about what you're praying. See, you've got a need here. Whatever it is you're praying about. So you lift up your voice in the Spirit and you'll intercede according to the will of God. Perfect will of God. That's what Romans 8 says. We're going to read it in a moment. But when you pray with your understanding, you think, well, this is the way it ought to be. And this seems logical. And I've got a PhD in psychology, so this is what ought to be done in that individual's case. And you get your old logic and reason and intellect in it, which sometimes has its place. We've already said that, so we don't have to keep saying it, do we? <laughs> Likewise, the Spirit helps our weaknesses. That's your head weakness. You're weak in the head is what he's talking about. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. So he's talking about the weakness in your head. Translated King James infirmity, but the word in Greek means weakness. You're not sick. So it must mean weakness with your understanding. We know not what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, that is, with understanding. And he that searches the hearts knows what's the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit makes intercession for the saints, that's us, according to the will of God. Praying in the Spirit is the corrective for getting your intellect in the way of God's will. God wants His will done in your life. You want God's will done in your life. Pray in the Spirit about it. Pray in the Spirit. And then you'll always have intercession by the Spirit according to the will of God. Because the Holy Spirit's giving you the words. There's no way that He can pray contrary to the will of God. And you can't. I don't care how smart and educated you are and how logical it looks. Some of the best logic is not the way. Sometimes God has said to me, don't get your logic in it. Because that doesn't change people. You see, logically, you can be right sometimes. 
give you an example. Maybe I've said it before. I stand here sometimes at 11 o'clock. That's all right. I've got to study in there. I'll talk to you as long as you need to be talked to or counseled, prayed for, whatever. Now, I'm not encouraging you to say, oh, good, two hours. <laughs> that isn't what I said. But I'll stay here until everybody gets ministered to and go home and they're parked in my driveway. They want personal attention. Well, they can get it in there. And my logic wants to say, there I was till 11. Why didn't you just come on up and we can go in the study? Why, you know, come all the way over here at home and all of that? It's inconvenient even for them. And the Lord has spoken to my heart about that. Don't get your logic in it. They don't understand. That's the only way they know to do it. Again, I'm not encouraging you to wait for me over in the driveway. <laughs> but you know, it's so good to be able to hear the voice of the Spirit. Don't get your logic in it. They need help. This is the only way they know to get it. So help them. Praise the Lord. Now, again, you can't prove everything by one illustration or statement. Sometimes we may just say, no, you see me tomorrow, you know, or whatever. Depending on circumstances, maybe that's the 34th time you've talked to that brother or sister. Some of them, sometimes you've said, you don't listen to anything I tell you. Why counsel? You don't obey the word of God. Why don't you put some of that faith into practice? And they still keep coming and keep coming. And finally, you get to the place where you say, no more counseling. You're going to have to start obeying this word. What if I had 1,500 or 2,000 out there that had to have counseling every day for every decision? Well, it's impossible. You'd never get anything done. There's a place where you have to draw the line. So praying with the Spirit, we were saying, is a corrective for getting your intellect in the way when you pray. Praying in the Spirit is a corrective also for man's teaching on prayer. Most of the time when man teaches on the subject of prayer, as we said last week, he teaches you to condition your prayers with an if. Praying in the Spirit is a corrective for man's teaching on prayer. Why? The Holy Spirit will never pray if it be thy will about anything, most especially the promises of God. Because we're told he makes intercession according to the will of God. Why won't he pray if? Is because when you're praying in tongues, the Holy Spirit is giving you the words. And you'll never catch him doubting that God will do what he says and be praying through you in tongues, sending up a petition before the throne. If it be thy will, do what you've said is your will in the word. Isn't that ridiculous? Have you ever considered that most charismatics live and lead a double prayer life. Most charismatics, we can't say non-charismatics because of what I'm going to say. They lead a double prayer life when they pray with the understanding. Generally, they're either thinking or articulating if. Now, that's just a fact. It can't even be debated. Just go anywhere in any charismatic circle. Most praying is if. They've never been taught how not to. But when they pray in the Spirit, that's their double prayer life, you see, with the understanding if, but when they pray in the Spirit, they never pray if, because the Holy Spirit isn't going to pray if. God isn't going to say if back to himself. The Holy Spirit's God. God the Father made the promises. God the Son went to the cross, provided, let's take healing, for example. It works for anything else, but he provided healing. God says in his word, 2 Corinthians 1.20, I've already said yes to that promise of healing that he makes all through the Bible. Old and New Testaments. Now, wouldn't it be ridiculous for the Holy Spirit, you start praying in tongues about healing, you're thinking if in your mind. You know, you can think with your mind while you're praying in the Spirit. Sure, you have to catch yourself sometimes. You're off on that vacation or whatever. Hey, come back here. I'm praying. This is serious. That's one area of praying in the Spirit you have to guard yourself against. The wandering mind. Oh, it'll wander when you're praying in English, but it's easier when you pray in the Spirit because the Spirit's praying through you. And so while you're thinking or saying if in English and then switch over to prayer in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit isn't going to pray if. It would be ridiculous for him to be sending up before the throne. Now, if it's my will to do what I've said is my will in my word, will I will to do my will or will I won't? <laughs> that would be ridiculous. He's never going to say if. That's why you shouldn't about a promise. Because that's a revelation of the will of God. The Holy Spirit always makes intercession according to the will of God. So can you. That is when you're praying about a promise because he gives the conditions to meet. And he, of course, is revealing his will when he said, I will do this or that for you when you meet the conditions. 
So the Holy Spirit isn't going to say, will I will to do what I've said is my will or will I won't? He isn't going to pray that way. He'll always pray a positive prayer, intercede for you. Again, you see this double prayer life when charismatics pray the so-called Lord's Prayer. In Matthew 6, 9 and following, Jesus said to pray this way, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And most put a period there. He didn't stop there. You know what he went on to say on earth as it is in heaven and so forth. But the logic of the prayers that you hear is based upon passages like this, his prayer in the garden or this prayer here. Well, we're told here in Matthew 6 to pray for God's will to be done. And so why shouldn't I pray for God's will to be done about everything about which I pray, you know, whether it's healing or whatever. Well, now Jesus didn't stop there. He said, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. On earth. That's where we are. As it is in heaven. Now, how's his will being done in heaven concerning healing, since that's what we've brought up? Well, if you were in heaven right now, you could search it from one end to the other. You'd not find a single person in a wheelchair on crutches. <laughs> with a broken arm or leg, blind eye, deaf ear. You'd not find a single case of leprosy or cancer. A child with a fever or a saint with a cough any more than you'd find some old stinking drunk or a woman in shorts reeking of cigarette smell, nor would you hear so-called Christian rock music. Do you know why you wouldn't see any sin or sickness in heaven? It's because God's will is being done there in every respect. Every respect. And Jesus said, pray, thy will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Why didn't you just say, God, do your will on earth? Of course, it would end up meaning the same thing if you can think beyond, you know, ABCs. But he specified on earth as it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. There are no sick people there. So don't cut him short and put a period where he didn't and say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Heal me. Thy will be done. Heal me. That isn't the way he said to pray. Now, you don't pray that way about sin, so why should you pray that way about sickness? I mean, if you're not going to believe that his will is to be done on earth in your body, then why do you pray as you do that his will be done in your spirit? Why do you pray, if it be thy will, those who do about healing your body, when you don't pray, now, God, if it's your will, I know you've said in your word not to sin, not to fornicate, not to lie or cheat. Now, if it's your will, you help me not to sin. If it's your will, I want to live today on this earth like people are living in heaven. There's no sin up there. If it's your will, give me the strength not to lie, cheat, fornicate, or sin. Now, you say, that's ridiculous. I wouldn't have to pray if it be thy will, help me or let me not sin. I already know his will. Well, his will concerning healing the provision, the promise is just as clear in the Word of God. So why do you believe the Word of man instead of the Word of God? It's that simple. People who are searching for proof text to justify why they don't believe the Word of God on healing, in Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, we have the account of the leper the multitudes were about, and the leper who came to Jesus and said, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus answered, I will. Be thou clean. And so the argument is on passages like this in the Lord's Prayer and Jesus' Prayer in the Garden. The argument is, if the leper can pray, if thou wilt, thou canst heal me, why can't I? Well, for the simple reason, Christian, the leper did not know the will of Christ concerning the healing of that leprosy, and you do. Oh, you've got a New Testament, a Bible filled with the promises of healing. Like Mark 16 like James chapter 5. Not only a Bible that gives you these promises of healing, but a Bible where Jesus said, I came down from heaven to do the will of my Father on the earth, and then he proceeded to heal people. He said, I always do those things that please the Father. Then he said about healing, He's just always healing. Which I guess if we could use some of this gray matter up here, you could figure it out that it must be God's will to heal on earth. 
and you don't have to pray if it be thy will. Since you've got the written word and you've got a Savior who says, I came to do his will, and he started healing people. And anyway, you've got no excuse. No one has an excuse after that leper asks the question. He forever settled it. He said, I will. <laughs> That's my will. Why well, didn't he say, oh, sometimes I just heal a few people occasionally when the anointing's there. If you keep trying to find proof texts for sickness in the Word of God, you're going to do like a lot of people do and end up charging the devil's work to God. You know, he's sending the sickness for my good and his glory. So, if we can get charismatics to see that it is necessary both to pray with the understanding and pray in the Spirit and never contradict those things, then we will have accomplished our purpose because most charismatics, not some, most lead a double prayer life. Do you really think the Holy Spirit is saying if when you pray? We could raise another question. Let's say you're praying with the understanding, as we often do. We'll pray with the understanding, then switch over to pray in the Spirit about the same things. Or we pray in the Spirit, and we're thinking about the need in our minds, which you do. And suppose the question is that a person is thinking if, because they've not been taught faith sufficiently. Most do not have the faith message. So whenever they pray about healing or anything else, it's with a big if on it. And they're thinking or saying if before they start praying in the Spirit. Now the question is, since the Spirit will not say if back to himself on the promise of God, which prayer is going to prevail in heaven? You've said if and he won't. Well, that's easy to figure out. Neither one will prevail. You just negated any help for healing by your big if. That's right. The Holy Spirit is not going to pray for your healing when you're doubting it. You can do that. You can say if and be praying in the Spirit. But if you could hear in a language you understood, let's say a translation or interpretation, what he's saying on your behalf. Oh, he's praying for you. He loves you. <laughs> if you could hear by interpretation what he's saying. When you got that big if, when he's sending up that intercession before the throne, he's saying he needs faith on this. He needs light on the subject of sickness and healing. This is what the Holy Spirit's saying. He needs to believe the word of God and not the word of man. He needs deliverance from a spirit of doubt, fear, or unbelief. That's what he's saying. He's saying, send him water. He's praying. He thinks, Coke, Coke. Holy Spirit's saying, send water. What does that mean? I think I told you about a long time ago in a message on the gifts. But I was in Dallas, Texas many years ago, and the evangelist was showing that the Holy Spirit makes intercession according to the will of God, and God gives us what we need, not always what we're thinking. Now, you should get your thinking in line with the Word, but let's be realistic. <laughs> a lot of people don't have it that way. So he says, my little boy, I think he was two years old or whatever, when he's thirsty, he says, Coke, Coke, and we go get him a glass of water. We're his parents. We know what he needs, not Coke, water. So which prayer prevails in heaven if you're saying if and the Holy Spirit never says if about the Word of God? Neither one prevails. He's praying something else. He's interceding for you. You just read it in Romans 8. You don't know how to pray as you are with that weak mind. I don't care how educated it is. He says we don't know how to intercede for ourselves because of our weaknesses. We don't know how to say these things that the Holy Spirit can say. And he makes intercession for us. And so... I'm not encouraging you to think if and the Holy Spirit's going to pray on your behalf. That isn't what I'm saying. But he's not going to be asking God to heal you while you're doubting it. God is going to work in every way he can to try to get faith in your heart. It's going to come through the Word. Well, you laid off church Wednesday night or Sunday morning or Sunday night because you had company or whatever, and he's going to convict you about that to get you under the Word. You're not going to get faith by him Pouring it in your head or by osmosis is going to come by the Word. When he's interceding, he isn't just turning it loose and saying, somehow I hope it works out. No, he's going to do all that from God's side he can do. Not just intercession, but intercession that's effective if you'll respond to it. Father, we ask you in Jesus' name to anoint this Word in a special way by the Holy Spirit to every heart where there was a lack of comprehension or understanding about anything that was said, then I make intercession on behalf of that individual 
and pray that you will help them to have understanding about what you were saying to us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.